We are recording. So welcome everybody to Pub 101. We are back. This is our fourth of seven meetings, if I am counting properly. And I'm so glad you're here as always. Um, our time together today, as per usual, I will do a short recap um, and follow up on last week. And then I'll hand things over to Carla Myers, who's gonna talk about defining your publishing program parameters, uh, particularly with MOUs or memorandums of understanding. And many of you probably already know Carla, but if you don't, she's also a uh, copyright expert. And so if um, we have extra time and uh, any of you wanna raise your copyright questions or consultations or talk amongst yourselves, as I'm sure there are many experts in the room that uh, could be a possible bonus today. So where we've been wistfully looking back, uh, last week we talked about publishing program budgets and calls for proposals. And some of you understandably, I think were frustrated at more generous budgets and looking for ways that you could support publishing that are more accessible, more doable within the context uh, that you're working. And so I just uh, fully support that. And I think we can support one another in that. And as a reminder, publishing support can take so many different forms. Karen Bjork and I talked about that after our session last week. And so, you know, part of, part of the goal in sharing with you the many things that publishing can entail in this orientation, um, the idea is to think of it as a, as a buffet rather than a set menu. And so if you can um, sort of look at the buffet yourselves and figure out, you know, I can serve this and I can serve that, I think it will be really helpful and it will be really helpful in communicating your program. So, you know, when we drafted our, um, our uh, I keep wanting to say personal ads because they were like personal ads, our call for proposals, our matchmaking ad, some of you said, you know, hey, I'm, I'm an OER enthusiast here to offer your publishing support. And so it's that, that word publishing that I think will be really helpful to unpack um, so that you might end up clarifying your ad in the future to say, you know, OER enthusiast here to offer copyright or license support or repository help, you know, really kind of try to um, specifically define what it is you can do within your context and capabilities so that um, everyone has a shared understanding of what that is. And so today's conversation, of course, will tie into that. So where are we going? I hope uh, towards a peaceful future together of many happy publishing projects where we all feel uh, like we're working within our capacity. Um, we're gonna continue focusing on project management and why an MOU is your friend. Uh, we're gonna talk about uncovering expectations that uh, others may have of you or, you know, again, uh, based on a, an unshared understanding of what publishing means. We're gonna talk about defining deliverables and working with authors. And as I just talked about clarifying publishing support so that publishing is um, not used as a defining term. So here are some ideas uh, just sort of coming away from last week's session, what publishing support may mean at your institution working within your capacity and the resources that you have. This of course is not an all-inclusive list, but I hope there's something here that may excite you or resonate with you or feel like, you know what, that's doable. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that and run with it. And this is how publishing support is gonna work at our institution for now. I would also like to take this opportunity to invite all of you to our next office hours coming up already next week on the 18th. It's a little bit of a continuation from January session when we talked about engaging leadership in OER. We're gonna focus uh, this month on engaging student leaders in OER. We have four guests. We just confirmed, confirmed our fourth today. And so I think it's gonna be a really great conversation on uh, building those relationships, how student engagement got started on different campuses, effective strategies for maintaining that momentum year after year, even as students graduate and the impact that students can have on engaging leadership in um, building OER programs. So I hope any or all of you can join us. I also wanna put in a quick plug for your feedback. Um, at the end of every unit in our Canvas curriculum, there is a Google form. 
I read the feedback and I use it to improve the curriculum for the next round. And so, especially with that in mind, if you give the unit a three or less, I don't think we've had less, but even a three, which is like middling, uh, specific comments are really helpful. So I just want you to know, I appreciate your specific comments. Um, if you feel like giving it a three, please try and find a sentence to say, here's what's lacking, or here's you know what I think this needs. Uh, that would be fantastic. And I also just want to put a um, bee in your bonnet, pin in your hat, feather in your cap, I'm not sure. A little reminder uh, that at the end of Pub 101, we will also do a survey of the final meeting to see what's especially helpful, what you wish we would have covered. Um, and there's a typo, I could use a proofreader here. What would you like to cover? Um, maybe there's something within your uh, professional experience that you think, you know what, this would be a great Pub 101 session. By all means, let me know. Um, this is a collaborative effort and we're in it together. And by no means do I mean to present myself as an expert. We are gathering together to share expertise. Uh, my role and the OEN's role is really as facilitator. So we are always really excited when someone steps forward and says, what about this idea? So um, please feel free to, to share those with us. And now uh, a smidge early, I'm gonna introduce Carla and then we'll do a quick poll before I really hand things over to her. But um, I would like to introduce Carla Myers. She's assistant librarian and coordinator of scholarly communications at Miami University Libraries, which is in Ohio where I believe it is quite snowy and cold. Uh, but before I turn things over to Carla, let's do a poll. With any luck, you are all seeing a poll on your screen, MOUs and you. Please flag me down if you do not see a poll on your screen. There it is, I see the responses. Number one, have you ever created a memorandum of understanding? Yes, no, not sure. Number two, have you ever signed an MOU? Yes, no, not sure. And number three, have you ever sat down and talked through an MOU with involved parties? I bet if you did, it may have been memorable. Yes, no, not sure. Uh, please just take a moment to kind of get your brain into this MOU space, reflecting on experience you may already have, um, thinking about what about it may have gone well or what about it may have gone wrong as sort of a mental framework for our conversation with Carla. All right, 97% of you have voted. I think that may be our best polling turnout so far. I'm going to end the poll share results with you. As you can see, 76% of you have not created an MOU before, so um, this will be a great opportunity to learn more about it. And for those of you who have, please chime in in the chat or unmute uh, if you have experience you'd like to share. Have you ever signed an MOU? This is a little more split. 40% of you have, 50% of you have not, and 10% of you are not sure. And then number three, have you talked through an MOU? Also split about 43% yes and 57% no. So thank you for sharing your MOU history with us. And without further ado, I am happy to turn things over to Carla. Okay, can you see my PowerPoint and hear me okay? Yes. Awesome, awesome. So hey everybody from um, very snowalicious, I love that Ohio, it is snowing cats and dogs out there. Um, this is kind of crazy and I love the snow. Um, so I am at Miami University, which is in Ohio, not Florida. Um, a little bit of trivia, Miami and Florida is named after Miami University. The city was founded by a couple of our alumni. Um, I'm really excited to be here to talk with you about this topic. Um, and one thing that Karen said that I really wanna reinforce is to not only encourage you to think about um, not just publication programs, but all facets of this is kind of a buffet or a menu that you can see what is to your taste or you know what fits well on your plate. Rather than thinking because somebody else is doing something, we have to be doing that too. Um, and there's so many factors that come into that. You know, of course, there's budgetary considerations, there's staffing considerations. When I first started working with this at Miami University, a lot of the people I was talking to was like, 
OpenStax, they're fabulous. You know, it's, it's, we need to be publishing like OpenStax. And when I finally did my presentation, it was entitled, We're Not OpenStax, and that's okay. Um, because while I have tremendous respect for the work that OpenStax do, I'm one person with no real concrete and steady budget to do all of this. Um, and the OpenStax model just isn't a fit for Miami University. Now, we will certainly take advantage of the resources that they put out. But I think the most successful publishing programs are scoping them to what resources do we have to provide them? Um, what services do our campus community need? And kind of trying to find the balance between the two. And I think creating MOUs can be a little bit of that. Um, ah, not advancing. Okay, so um, where are we right now in the publication process? So you've put out your call for proposals. Hopefully you've gotten some great proposals for some things. Now comes the time that you say, okay, we want to get started on this. Um, so let's put together a memorandum of understanding so we can figure out what are we agreeing to. An MOU stands for Memorandum of Understanding. It is a quasi-legal document. Um, you know, you could draw up very formal 15-page contracts um, when you're deciding what do we want them to give to us, what services are we going to provide back to them. There are pros and cons to doing that. Um, I think memorandums of understanding are a much better fit for this type of program, though, for a couple of reasons. So number one, you don't have to be an attorney to draft a memorandum of understanding. You may not need to have your campus administrators sign off on it like you would a legal contract. It can be very difficult to change a legal contract. In MOU, you're like, eh, we're not doing that anymore. Strike that out of there. We need to change some dates. I'm going to go ahead and change that in the file and make sure we both have a copy. So there's a lot more flexibility in that. Um, you can really customize these to be as long or as short as you need. And I wanna give you an example of that as we get toward the end of something we're dealing with here at Miami University. So why have an MOU? I think the biggest reason for having an MOU is just to be clear on what each group can expect from the other group and a tentative timeline for the project. So it's just kind of saying, okay, to make clear expectations of who all is involved, what all we are going to be doing and our goals for this project. Here is how we want to move forward and in what capacity. So one of the first considerations is who is this agreement going to be between? Now, most likely is going to be between the authors. Um, now that could be one author. There could be multiple authors. You could have seven authors sign the MOU. You could have one author who signs on behalf of four other authors they're working with. You could have one author you are primarily working with, but they're working with their students to create content for the OER. Um, the MOU is kind of like if you think about principal investigators or project leads, here are the people who are going to be primarily taking responsibility for this particular project. So author or authors in that capacity. One question that may come up um, that you probably want to talk with your administrators or maybe your institution's legal counsel about is, is the agreement going to be between, be between the library, um, the authors, and the institution, or maybe even if you're lucky enough that your institution has a publishing program or a press that's supporting this project between the press and the authors. Um, I've seen these crafted in all three different capacities. Here at Miami, the MOU, I sign the MOU, but the agreement is generally between the authors and Miami University. Um, it's tricky to say I'm signing on behalf of Miami University because that has all kinds of legal compli complications. But as the project manager for the publishing program in the library, I am signing. Um, the reason we kind of have it be between Miami University and the authors is I love my job. I hope to be here for a long, long time. Um, but maybe I win the lottery next week and decide, you know what, that's it. I'm retiring. Or uh, maybe at some point in my career, I move on to a different job. That way it's not tied to me and my position specifically, because my position was actually created out of the reformatting of another position before me. Um, that we have the consistency that it's between Miami University and the authors. 
Um, so just some considerations about who is going to be signing this on the author side, but then also is it between your library, the institution, how do you want to work that for the side that you're managing? What is in your MOU? Um, these can be as complicated or as simple as you want. Um, we've had about three OER projects. Um, one kind of fizzled out kind of fast, and I'll talk with you about that in a moment. One is on hold for right now, and one we are spinning up very quickly. Um, the one that is kind of on hold, I think we have about a four-page MOU for that. So that one's kind of interesting because this author has published their work and in published, I guess I should say produced, they've hired a third party company, it's a lab manual, to produce that for them in the past. She wrote everything, they basically just printed it for her. Um, the one that kind of fizzled out, um, we had, I think, about a similar length MOU. Um, and I'll tell you about why that fizzled out in a second. The project that we're getting ready to launch, it's basically half a page because they've already written everything. I already have their document in hand. I kind of don't need them to do anything else except pick a Creative Commons license um, and just make it clear that, you know, Miami University reserves the right to make changes to this under the Creative Commons license moving forward into the future. So um, what is included in it can really be dependent on your situation and what services you're offering and things like that. Um, key things, though, are going to be what is the author going to deliver to you? Is it text? Is it um, video recordings? Is it something else? Um, if it's a textbook, which is mostly what we're thinking about here, um, in terms of figures and images, are they going to be creating those on their own? Are they going to be getting them from somewhere else? What format are they going to deliver them in? Um, and if your institution is making the author responsible for clearing permissions, how you want that delivered as well. The MOU should also say what you are going to deliver. Um, generally, this could be, um, are you going to help find contributors, maybe for case studies or chapters? Are you going to help them with peer review? Um, are you going to be providing services like copy editing, layout, all these fun things that you're learning as part of um, uh, Pub 101? Um, it might be that you're providing some of these services, but not all of these services. And then, of course, what you will be doing is helping to support the publication of the final item. So kind of just starting off with um, who's involved, who's going to be involved with this project, and what are each of these individuals or groups responsible for? What is your timeline? Um, generally thinking about, you know, how fast do you want to move forward with this project? When do you expect different things to be done? When do you expect the authors to get you a draft? When do you expect them to get the final version that's then going to go into copy editing layout or all of that? What is your turnaround time going to be for getting that back to them? How long are they going to look over the changes in formatting and everything you've done to approve that? Um, the number one thing that I can say here is to be flexible. A lot of my publication experience comes from being a journal editor and I will tell you, um, I pretty much fall out of my chair when my authors deliver stuff on time. Because you know what? Life happens. We have families, you know, we have things that come up on our own. We get work projects dumped on top of us. Very few people that I've worked with, um, whether it's with OER publishing or with journal publishing, have spitefully said, ha, Carla, I'm not turning that in just, you know, make you miserable. In fact, nobody's ever said that. The vast majority of people contact me and are exceedingly apologetic and say, something come up. I'm still working on this, but I need a little bit more time. What I tell everybody is talk to me. Um, you know, if you talk to me, I understand life happens. I've been behind on deadlines too. If I know what's going on, we can plan accordingly. Um, I've had some people who just stop talking to me and part of you is worried. This person is a nice person. Are they okay? Is everything all right? In those few situations, and I've tried a few slide tricks to finally get a hold of them and talk to them in person. Um, every time they've been like, Carla, I'm so sorry. I was just so embarrassed that I didn't turn this in on time. Even with professional publishing, um, uh, I once had a journal editor tell me about 75% of the people don't turn their manuscripts in on time. And you know what? That's okay. 
So put a timeline in there just as tentative dates. But what I tell people is however long you think it's going to take, maybe plan for about double that. But tell your authors or the people you're working with, if you're not going to make your deadline, that's okay. Just talk to me. And the same for you. If something goes on and you were doing formatting or something else, and that's going to slow down the timeline on your end, shoot that author or the people you're working with a fast email just saying, hey, we're running a little bit behind, but here's when we expect to have it to you. So be flexible on this. How will the materials be submitted in what format? Um, I actually had somebody who sent me a PDF for their book. That was kind of interesting, um, especially sometimes because when you try to unlock those PDFs, it can have issues with the formatting. Um, especially for image and graphics, you might want to have a certain quality or a certain size. Or especially for accessibility, I think it's really best to have the authors add the alternate text to the images and graphs. Um, so they can communicate to anybody who may be listening or using some type of adaptive technology to engage with that alternate text to get the message they want out of that particular image. And of course, citations. Um, making sure that everything they've cited in their book, we have the full citation for that in some capacity. Or something you might want to take a look at is, is everything in their reference list actually cited in their book? Should some of that be in a bibliography list instead? Or did they cite something in the text at one time and pull that out and forget to move the reference? And what way are those formatted? Um, uh, it, it's not unusual for me to get reference lists that seem to take advantage of like five different citation types. Also, sometimes people will use the bibliography function and Microsoft Word, and that is a disaster. I tell them, I know this is more work for you, but um, I need to have you manually type these out. Not only because it's really hard to go in and edit that box when Microsoft Word formats it, but they make so many mistakes um, that uh, generally when I'm working with people, we agree on the citation format, and I make it clear to them, Here's, you know, Purdue Owl. I will check out of the library a copy for you of the citation style guide that you can have on hand, but we need to have those citations fully and completely listed in the references and in this particular format. Copyright considerations. Uh, I love talking about this topic in general, but I always love talking about copyright too. Um, what are the authorship considerations? Are we just working with one author? Are we working with multiple authors? Could there be a work made for hire situation somewhere where we have a professor who has employed a graduate student who is making some things because they were hired to do that maybe rather than students in their class? I had a really fun situation where I was talking with an author about some images and charts and graphs in the book. And they said, well, my husband created those. So I'm just telling my husband I'm using them. And uh, I said, we're actually going to get a permission letter from your husband just to make sure all our ducks in a row. And uh, she's like, he's never going to let me live that down. Um, but, you know, what are the situations that works are being brought into this particular project? Some MOUs contain information um, that are certifications and indemnity. So a certification is kind of just saying, I certify that this is true. Um, where I've seen these used in MOUs is usually some type of language saying that I certify that the, I am the creator of this content, that it is not some way um, encumbered or otherwise maybe controlled by some other type of agreement or transfer of copyrights. For example, maybe you have a faculty member who is interested in writing and OER. And they want to use um, as chapters articles that they've published before. Um, it could be as part of that publication process, they sign their copyright over to that journal or that book publisher they were working with then. Um, so part of the certification is saying, nope, I still actually own the copyright in this material. And the indemnification is saying, just in case I'm lying about this, I'm indemnifying Miami University or your institution from liability. This is getting into a little bit more legally language. The one place where we really look to use this in our MOUs at Miami University was when um, I've been working with a faculty member who has had um, basically printers publishing this lab manual. 
So I'm like, I need you to triple check that at no point you signed your copyright over to them. Um, because if you have, it, it's going to make it almost impossible for us to publish this as an OER. Um, and I will share out some language later, or I think there's a little bit of language about this in some of the simple MOUs that you can take a look at and, um, you know, use if you feel that it requires it. Um, free from libelous materials. Um, basically, what this is looking for is that, you know, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a good example now. Um, I'm going to totally make something up. I'm not calling Karen a big jerk and a quack because of blah, blah, blah in my book. Totally unjustified. Now, maybe I think Karen's a quack because, you know, we both study cheetahs and her theory on cheetah evolution, I think, is just ridiculous. She probably thinks I'm a quack because of my uh, theories on it. Um, but just making sure that it's all written in an appropriate manner. And then, of course, the open license for the work. Um, some institutions let the author choose any Creative Commons license. We don't care which one you choose as long as you choose one. Some require authors to use a certain specific Creative Commons license. So if you are going to publish with us, maybe you have to choose a CC BY license. Here at Miami University, we generally let them pick from a couple CC licenses. Um, usually CC BY or CC BY ND. Um, we're pretty comfortable with both of, both of them. Um, so having them choose which one they want to have applied to your particular work. Budget. This can be the hard thing. Um, what is the budget that you can offer for this project? That could include an honorarium or some type of stipend for the author or authors while they're working on it. Um, if so, and I'm just going to make, some, make something up, say you're offering a $500 honorarium or a $500 stipend, is that per author or is that for all of the authors to share? If you have multiple authors, you want to be clear on that. Um, maybe you have a budget that they could use to hire a graduate student. Maybe there's a little of a budget that can be used for some development of professional graphics, things like that. Maybe there really is no budget. Maybe they're doing this um, because they're so excited about publishing open and you are going to be doing all the publishing work in house. So there's no real cost there either. Um, one thing to make clear here is that there are no royalties being paid to the author for the publication of that work. And I'm sure you're all like, well, yeah, Carla, that makes sense. This is an open educational resource after all. But the reason our first publication fizzled out here at Miami University is I was working with the nicest professor. He's a wonderful person. And he heard about this program and he wanted to publish an OER in a really unique area. And I got approval to bring him into the program. And when we sat down to go through the MOU, he's like, but Carla, where does it talk about my royalties? And I'm like, oh, there, there's no royalties. We're, we're going to give you a small honorary as a thank you, but you know, this is made freely available. So there's kind of no royalties to be paid out. And he was like, oh, I don't want to do this then. And it turned out he had children getting ready to go to college. And he saw this as a way of another revenue stream. stream. And I certainly didn't begrudge him that. But um, where the idea that this is a free and open publication and there's no royalties can be very intuitive to us. Um, and I thought I had communicated that clearly. It, it, it didn't get translated to him. So even when we're not paying any money, I still put in that, you know, there is going to be no transfer of funds, you know, we're not providing any money and there's no royalties to be paid, just so they don't come back six months later and say, hey, when am I getting that first check? Contingency planning. We already talked a little bit about this, but one of the things I love about MOUs is their flexibility because I promise issues will arise and that's life. It happens every single day. Um, it could be that people get busy. Um, the second project we were working on with lab manuals, this person was so excited to make these freely available and to get something out there that we hadn't really seen yet as far as an open lab manual. Um, there were cuts here at Miami University, unfortunately, so they lost some people in their department and they were kind of quickly shifted over to an administrative role. They also had some things going on personally with health issues in their family. 
And I felt horrible because they were pretty much in tears. And they said, Carla, I don't have the bandwidth for this at the moment. And my response was, put it on the back burner and just leave it there. And when you're ready to come back to me, come back to me and we will pick up where we left off. Um, and it might just not be on the author's end. It could be on your end too. Maybe somebody leaves your department, maybe a little bit of money that had been budgeted for this. You know, now in the time of COVID-19 and the pandemic, I know a lot of libraries are having their extra money swept to, you know, be put toward different things. So just making it clear upfront that issues will arise, but you cannot over communicate. Um, if something comes up on your end that could delay or impede production of the work, reaching out to the authors and saying, here's what's going on and letting them know too, if something comes up, that's okay, we can work with it. Just reach out to me and let me know what's going on and we'll find a plan for moving forward. Drafting your MOU. Um, one thing I wanna put out there, which I think this was maybe Rebel who told me about it and I hadn't thought about it till then. Um, the fabulous Rebel is in on this conversation is um, being aware of institutional policies about the amount of work that a person can do. And this can be especially relevant if, you're, it's, if employees at your institution are unionized. So with union contracts, there can actually be very specific rules about um, employees taking on job responsibilities over and above their contract. And so if you do have faculty or students, or if the employees at your entire university is unionized, this is just something you might wanna have in the back of your head. Um, I haven't worked in an institution yet that's run into that issue. So I was glad, I think that was you Rebel, brought that up and made me aware of that. Um, so reach out to HR or maybe the legal counsel at your institution and be like, hey, is there just anything I need to be cognizant of as part of this? The next question is draft versus swipe. Do you want to write your own MOU from the ground up or do you want to swipe what somebody else has done? Swipe, 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 swipe. I will tell you here at Miami University, I swiped. Um, there is the fabulous agreement that Karen has at um, Portland State. Um, and what I really love about hers is she talked about, you know, every time we would kind of do one of these, oh, we need to add that in. Maybe we need to reword that. So I'm always interested to see what draft of their MOU they're on because the changes she's made to it are very insightful for the publishing program, especially if you need some of that legal language. Um, I am not an attorney. I've been working with copyright for over 15 years now. Sometimes you need to be an attorney to write some of that really in-depth, fancy legal language. Um, I went into my book contract and stole some of that, um, you know, just to get an idea of what that was and share that with my Office of General Counsel as we were working on our MOU. But there's lots of institutions out there that have already created these. Um, I know there's some examples of these in the publishing curriculum go take a look at the different MOUs that are out there and grab a piece from this one and grab a piece from that one and grab a piece from that one. Put together what works best for you and your institution, keeping in mind that you might have a different MOU for each project. Like I said, our first project was kind of a standard MOU really based off what Karen Bjork had done at Portland. Our second one had a little bit more cautious legal language in it because we wanted to make sure they certified and indemnified. Um, and this last one, um, it's really fun because I'm working with an attorney on it. So you'd think we'd have a really scrupulous one. And it's basically like, no, pick the license that you want to use. It's, it's, it's a really simple one. So customize it to, to what your particular project is. Tips and recommendations. Um, use plain language. You know, even something like indemnify and certify, sometimes those will be in there, but you can add language like, um, you know, indemnifying, which means to kind of make it a little bit more clear to people what they are agreeing to. Um, organize the document logically. That could be here is what the author or authors are agreeing to. Here's what the institution is agreeing to. Here is the budget and then here are timelines. Um, and then I usually have a little part that says contingencies, and it basically says if anything in this needs to be reviewed or revised, that either party will contact the other one to have a discussion about that. Um, and just really think about what are the key areas that you need to have covered for the particular situation that you're publishing in. Um, setting expectations. 
Um, we communicate early on as part of our call for proposals that there is an MOU. I tell people, contact me if you would like to review that before putting in a proposal for our publishing program. Once somebody, um, once we've agreed to take on a project, um, as they're submitting their paperwork and the proposal, I'm like, you looked at the MOU, right? Once they've agreed to take their project, I said, okay, now we need to set up a time where we are going to sit down and go line by line through this MOU. And that I always worry that they may seem um, a little patronizing. That is never my intent. My intent is I'm asking you to put your name on something and I don't want you to put your name on something. Number one, unless you really understand everything that we are asking you to do or agreeing to. And number two, so we can care, clear up any confusion early on. You know, it would have really ripped my heart out if we would have published that first work under an open license. And then one month after it was published, they're like, hey, Carla, where's my first royalty check? And then I, you know, we had the conversation about, well, there are no royalties. And now chances are no textbook publishing program, um, commercial one would accept it because it's already been put out there freely. Um, so really just going through it, encouraging them to ask questions, giving examples, being very forthright. Um, and then usually what I'll do is after that conversation say, okay, think about this for a day or two. Let me know if you have any questions before you sign it. And when you're ready to sign, sign, send it back to me. I'll sign it on behalf of our publishing program and we're all set to move forward. Um, I think the great thing, like I said, about MOUs are it just sets expectations for the project. What are you bringing to it as the author or authors? What am I bringing to it as the person coordinating this program? What is the final product we want to have at the end of this working together? And what is our tentative timeline? I tend to do regular check-ins. Um, so, hey, I see this date we originally talked about is kind of getting close. You know, do you think you'll still have something for me come this date? Or just even send them an email like, hey, just checking in, how is it going with everything? Um, renegotiate these, reword these, take things out, add things in if needed. There may be some things that you cannot wiggle on. If you have a budget of $500 for this project and that is your budget, that is your budget. Um, so saying, you know what, I'm so sorry, but you know, we just can't get any more funding for this particular project at this moment. Now I can be flexible with dates. I can be flexible with other things. Um, one thing where I'm really not flexible, both as a publisher and a copyright librarian, is the citations and copyright information for third party works you are looking to reuse. I tell them up front, you need to be tracking that up front. You need to be making sure you have that handy or are saving that information every single time. Because if you've ever found yourself in a situation where you have to go back and try to recreate a Google or Creative Commons search and figure out where they got some of this stuff from. Um, I'm a single person operation here. I, I just don't have the bandwidth for that. So that's one thing I'm really not negotiable on. Think about what you cannot kind of negotiate or wiggle on. Make that clear up front, but also make it clear up front where you do have some wiggle room. I've thrown a lot at you. I hope this is all helpful. Um, I am here to answer your questions. And much like I tell the authors that I'm working with, take some time to process this. Um, within the next few days, if you have questions about this, reach out to me. I'm happy to talk to you. Reach out to Karen. She is another fabulous resource. Um, but, you know, it's um, every program is different. There are some institutions that have whole departments supporting these things. Um, there are other places, there's lots of places where it's just one individual person with a budget only when they beg for it or can get it from somebody else. Um, we don't have to recreate the wheel in everything. One thing I love about this community is that we really live the principle of openness. And to date, there has not been one single person that if I have a question about what they're doing or can I see your documentation, that I've reached out to them that they've said, no, I'm not going to share with you. Um, and that includes knowledge and answering the questions or just documentation and other resources that people have put together reach out, don't reinvent that wheel if you have to, let other people help you make your program successful. Thank you so much, Carla. Okay, so as, um, as you gather your thoughts and your questions, I will um, get us started here because there's a couple in the chat. So 
Um, you talked a little bit, I think, about the possibility of updating OER. And so there's a question, uh, should we build in a budget line for updating OER textbook every X number of years? And so I think there's even two questions there, a, a budget line potentially, but also just some sort of formalized expectation that this book will be maintained or revisited as time goes by. So uh, any thoughts on that, Carla, or anyone else in the call? Yes, that is a fabulous question. Um, so one thing we do, of course, want to do is make sure these OERs are up to date. I think especially in areas, and if I'm wrong, somebody tell me this, maybe like economic theory or something like that, um, or the health sciences, where we could see new discoveries, new facts, new information constantly needing to be updated. So the Creative Commons license that is attached to the OER is going to allow most people to make the updates um, the institution, the publishing program, that needs to be made. What we generally say is that um, if we are seeking to have a new revision, um, a revised version made, that we will reach out to the faculty member to offer them the opportunity to make those revisions first. But if for whatever reason they um, do not wish to or are not able, that we will try to find somebody else suitable to make that version. Um, we do that, number one, kind of just a heads up that this is something we may approach you for in the future to do a revision. The tricky thing is budget. Um, you know, Miami University is a fairly well-resourced institution. We are not Harvard. We don't have huge endowments. But having worked at smaller institutions, Having worked with individuals at community colleges, I know we have a better budget than most. That said, um, the resources for our publishing program are something I kind of have to know, go negotiate on a project by project basis. Unfortunately, my institution has found funding for everyone I brought forward, but we may not have the money to do a revision in the future. Now, you can go look for grants. Maybe they're willing to do it gratis. Maybe you can find somebody else who's willing to do it gratis. Um, so, I, and I'll have to take a look at the language we used. I think it's something like if there is a need to do a revision in the future, um, pull up that language because sometimes they might come to you and say it's a year later I'm ready for version two and you're like we don't have the money for that like maybe in two years I'll have the money but not now so I will double check on the language we use and Karen I will get that to, to you to share with the group um, but the Creative Commons license will generally let you do the versioning the language I use is just a heads up here's kind of the process um, and I got on one of my rambling tangents Karen I think I answered the first question what was the second one um, well, I think you covered them both, actually, the, whether, whether or not to do that and whether to create a budget for it. And Rebel is chiming in uh, in the chat that, Rebel, was this at Kansas or at Florida, or do you want to unmute and, and share? Sorry, I was just saying, yeah, at Kansas State, we kind of recommended revisions every two years um, with our publications and also at University of South Florida, um, at least somebody to review it and ensure that it's still relevant, even if a new edition wasn't put out. And also I did out that the getting the revision budget was really hard. Um, it took me, um, it took the program five years for me to be able to push to even start having that conversation about should we have revision grants and I still don't think they're doing them. So yeah, thank but it's you important, I think, to keep it relevant. Yeah, this is, I think this is such an interesting question and another dimension of it gets back to, uh, you know, the session we had with Amanda, I think, in thinking about is, is your publishing support a reflection of your institution or your organization or the library, or is it more about I'm providing one-on-one -on -one support for this faculty author and I'm defining that support, you know, very, in these very specific ways. Because I think there's a difference between, hey, we helped get the, get this 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 book out the door, and it's published, and here it is, and we play this role. Versus, here is the suite of publications that we have produced through our OER publishing program, and here's you know here's how it works. I think that that kind of whether you're on one side of the spectrum or another could also inform how you may answer this question. But it's also another interesting question just about OER in general, since it does have that open license. The idea is that anyone can, the idea, 
is that anyone can edit it, you know, exactly how they want to use it in their classroom. Of course, um, easier said than done when it comes time to actually like get into a file and make changes. But, you know, I think those are good, good things to weigh when answering that question. So I appreciate all of the different um, scenarios. Let's see. Um, okay, we were talking about royalties and the story of um, one of your dear authors excited about royalties. I will editorialize a bit and say it is a very special author who can um, fund an education or uh, you know, a fairly expensive item uh, through publishing a textbook. So sometimes the expectation and then the reality uh, doesn't always line up, um, but that may be too awkward of a conversation to have. Uh, so thinking about royalties, uh, Rebel mentioned print on demand can be a replacement for royalties if you allow this in the MOU. And so there are some um, programs, I think uh, even open book publishers in the UK, for example, they fund a lot of their publishing through uh, selling print copies, but it will depend a bit on the license. Rebel, I invite you if you'd also like to chime in on this or anyone else about how you may have set that up or Carla. Yeah, and that's actually one model we're considering here at Miami University for a little bit more steady income of money. Um, is that if anybody wanted to download the copy, that would be free. But my argument is it would be a rare library that's going to download a 300 page book, print it off, bind it and put it in their collection. Chances are they would like a print on demand where they can get a nice hardcover copy to put it in their collection. Um, so one of the things we're looking at here is, could we get a platform that would allow us to do free digital downloads, but sell that print on demand? And what I was talking about is um, generally in those situations, the publishing platform keeps some of the royalties. Um, but of what's left, a two thirds, one third split, that one third of that will go to the author. So in lieu of giving them an honorarium, they would get one third of what's returned to the university. The other two thirds goes back to funding the publishing of other OER. Um, and we're hoping to accomplish two things of that. Number one, if we need money for, you know, revisions down the road. But um, it is my sincere hope that our program, if we can implement this, would not just be Miami University, because even scaling something like this is pretty big, that we could bring in authors from across the nation. Um, especially underrepresented voices, people in marginalized communities, um, areas where we're not seeing a lot of OER published, and use some of those funds to help publish and get their voices heard. So that is one option that we are even taking a look at, and we're looking at ubiquity for doing that. Great. I'm going to add on uh, a little bit to the conversation we were just having about maintaining and um, I just want to put a, a note. Um, I keep trying to find the right expression, the right saying. What's what's the right saying for a reminder? Uh, anyway. Um, tie a string around your finger? Tie a string around your finger. Let's go with that one. Thank you. <laughs> um, when we hear from Corinne next week at Virginia Tech, they've been experimenting with a lot of different ways to how to sort of crowdsource and capture ideas for revisions and updates. And I think they've done that uh, mostly through Google Forms, but of course, you know, working to get the word out, working to invite people to say, you know, hey, I think page 33 needs to be revisited, things like that. So there's a lot of different hypotheses is a good tool for that as well. Um, there's a lot of different ways to um, experiment with, with revisions uh, and potentially new additions. Let's well, see. Just, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, just to build on that a little bit, um, one source we found for support of our OER program is our alumni. Um, I got to talk in front of some of our alumni about, you know, the need, not just in our community, but everywhere for access to free, good quality information, especially textbooks, um, about our return on investment um, that, you know, with a few thousand dollars, we can save students tens of thousands of dollars. And some of our alumni have very generously donated to our program as a result. Um, so yeah, with those budget struggles, just where are different places that you can get money from, whether it's the original version or whether it's revisions. Thanks, Carla. Well, we have a few minutes left. Um, I think in the chat we have um, 
comments, Amy uh, appreciated the, the clarity of the presentation and how particulars work with the MOU. So I'm so glad it was helpful. And then um, others who are looking at ubiquity as well. So are there other questions about setting up your program or how to work individually with authors or copyright questions? Anything that any of you would like to take advantage of this time that we have left? I would love to know how Carla feels about the copyright small claims and OER. Um, I'm particularly um, concerned about OER with that, so. That's a great question. So when the omnibus spending bill was passed late in 2020, attached to that was legislation called the CASE Act, which creates a copyright small claims court. Copyright law is federal law. So Rebel, I'm going to pick on you because you brought this up. Um, say Rebel took a picture and I decided to put that picture in a calendar and use that. And Rebel wants to sue me for copyright infringement. Prior to the passage of Case Act, she would have had to sue me in federal court. It can kind of be expensive to take somebody to court in federal court. Um, I've heard people say fifty dollars to $100,000 just to get in front of a judge because there's so much paperwork, you know, the attorneys you need, everything like that. What the Case Act allows is for Rebel to bring an infringement claim against me in front of a tribunal of employees from the U.S. Copyright Office. Um, so it's a smaller court, kind of in the same way you would see your traditional small claims court. The, the biggest, I don't know how to say this. This means that it's now a little bit easier for somebody to come after you for copyright infringement. Um, you have the option to opt out of these proceedings. I could say, no, thanks, Rebel. You have to come after me in federal court. You have fun with that. Um, This is still being unfolded. The legislation was just passed in December. If you read through the act, it's pages and pages long. The Copyright Office has 12 to 18 months to actually put this into practice. Libraries and archives can preemptively opt out of being um, of people bringing claims of infringement against them under the small claims court. So if your library is offering the publishing program, you could then opt out of it in that capacity. And I would think, and don't quote me on this because again, this is still kind of all unfolding. I would think then if your institution or the library was made to be the rights holder, that will kind of cover you preemptively acting out of, um, opting out of any legislation for that. I think where the real question comes is, you know, I use Rebel's picture in my OER before she had to take me to federal court. Now she can take me into the small claims court, which is still going to have its cost, but definitely much cheaper. Um, and especially the liability maybe for our authors. What I'm telling people right now is have this in the back of your minds. We never want to let copyright or claims of infringement scare us out of effectively teaching, helping our, helping our patrons find access to good information, nor do we want to ignore it either. So I think when we're using things that aren't covered by an open license or we haven't gotten permission for, thinking very carefully about our fair use argument, making sure we have sound reasoning under all four factors instead of just being, this is educational, that's fair use. Um, and being prepared that if a claim was ever brought against us, whether it's in the small court or in federal court, to me, it's important to be able to look a judge in the eye and explain your fair use. Um, and hoping that in the same way, many of the courts have consistently recognized the value and fair application of fair use in those situations in the past that the small claims court would do the same. Um, but thanks for bringing it up, Rebel. It's, it's, um, I hope this is okay. Tune into the Miami University's Libraries Copyright Conference in September because we're going to have a whole session on this because we're still trying to figure it out. Um, but this definitely is a new consideration for everybody with OER publication. Yeah, thanks very much. Fascinating. And I appreciate the question, Rebel. And it's interesting because 
I believe there will be some guidance coming on fair use in OER in the near future. And so these are exactly the kind of conversations we need to be having as the open ed community. I don't know, Carla, if you think we have enough time, Justin asked a related question in the chat. Would the author be liable if they maintain copyright ownership or would there be co-liability with the library or university as publisher? And that's one of the things to figure out. Um, so like I said, I think one way to kind of, and again, don't quote me on this, but my initial thought is one way to negate liability for the authors to have them transfer the copyright over to the library. Um, because the libraries can't preemptively opt out of um, claims under the CASE Act. There could be thinking generally about how cases are brought. Um, and again, this is hard with case because it's a little bit different. Generally with infringement cases, they like to go after people who have deep pockets. The vast majority of faculty I work with don't have deep pockets, hence they want to publish and get royalties to help get their kids through college. Um, or we all know what we get paid. So there can be more of incentive to go after the institution rather than the individual. Now, um, there is sovereign immunity for state institutions. We had that confirmed by the Supreme Court for copyright considerations. So it all kind of gets complicated. Um, under case, if it is a state or federal institution, I'm guessing they would probably go after the author because of the sovereign immunity. All they're really going to get is an injunction. So stop using that. Um, whereas with the author, they could kind of come after some type of financial um, penalty. Whew. Okay. It's complicated. Um, <laughs> Well, we'll definitely keep thinking about it all together. And um, these conversations are really helpful for shared understanding and, and hearing what people are you know, gonna try at their institution and giving us ideas for what we can do at our own. So we've spent another hour together. Uh, please join me in thanking Carla for uh, sharing her expertise with us and providing some, some guidance and suggestion on developing MOUs for your publishing program and working with your author. We will follow up with you and um, look forward to seeing you next week. Let us know if you have unanswered questions that occur to you and until then, take care. Take care everybody, thank you so much.